Okay, everyone, let's grab our seats. Uh, it's 8.29 p.m. My name's Ron, I'm an alcoholic. Welcome home, everyone. A couple quick announcements. This group is all about service. We've always constantly you know, put your money to work, whether it's just giving back to the group and the people in it, uh, to treatment centers. We, we purchase 600 big books. We give them away for free at treatment centers. We carry this message wherever we can. Today we donated an entire shopping cart of food to the homeless bank uh, in the Bucks County. So we're always trying to give back and be of service. So if you're interested in that, see us after the meeting uh, because it's a big part of what we do here. And if you'd like to be a part of that, be mindful when the seventh tradition comes around is that not only does it support the, the meeting and group, but it supports all our activities, our, our workshops, our everything that we do here. And uh, we love doing AA and, and with your support, we will put every dollar to work the best we can. And what else do we have to uh, Let's thank Jason. Uh, let's throw a little, he does our YouTube videos, so let's thank him because he's never here. He's out in Jersey. Tirelessly post these on here. We got 330,000 views. And uh, that's pretty amazing for a, a group like this uh, to have that kind of outreach. And so we're very mindful of what we do here and, and that the ripple effect that it has. And uh, we welcome everybody, especially if you're new here for the first time, hang out with us after the meeting. With that, we have our first time chairperson. Uh, she claims to be the best chairperson in our Alcoholics Anonymous. Let's welcome Victoria and see what she's got. Hey y'all, I'm Victoria, I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, this is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street, Doylestown, PA. Um, food and fellowship starts at 8 p.m. and the speaker starts at 8.30. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. right here. Please come early and join us. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God, reliance, and service to others through the practice and teachings of the 12 steps. We, work, we record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous to the group to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? I'm Paul. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Hi, Megan. Welcome. Hi, Jackie. Welcome. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi, Pat. Welcome. Hello, George. Welcome. Hi, Alex. Welcome. Hi, Chris. Welcome. Hi, Ted. Welcome. Hi, Joe. Welcome. Hi, Nico. Welcome. Cool. Stay, guys. Um, okay. The Conscious Con Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor, please raise your hands. Awesome. Um, are there any announcements for the good of AA? AA is good. Um, our sister group is a big book study meeting that meets every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. up the street at Salem UCC Church, 186 East Court Street, Doylestown. Coffee is on at, oh, Doylestown. Coffee is on at 6.15 p.m. Um, we have meeting list and big book big books on easy terms please see me or any home group member after the meeting if you cannot afford a big book the conscious contact speaker group will give you one at no charge anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and cds to help those who can't afford them can put donations in the jar on the table marked big book and cd cd donations all cds are available free of charge they're right back there um Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, PA, and our Facebook group. Subscribe and share, and you can find our speakers there. Join our Facebook page to keep informed and share upcoming events and meetings. Um, and I forget his name. Oh, Nick is coming up to read the Just for Today.
My name's Nick, I'm an alcoholic. Nick. Welcome home. The Just for Today prayer of recovery. Just for today I'll be agreeable. I will look as well as I can. Dress becomingly. Talk low, act courteously. Criticize not one bit, not find fault with anything, and not talk, try to improve or regulate anybody except myself. And now with that, I have Tom to come and read the AA preamble. I'm Tom, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, this is the AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither does neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And please help us welcome Kara to read the 12 steps. Good evening, y'all. My name is Kara. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Welcome home, everybody. The 12 steps of uh, recovery. Number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Number four, made a searching and fearless more inventory of ourselves. Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Number six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Number seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Number eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Number nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Number 10, continued to take personal inventory when we were wrong and promptly admitted it. Number 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying for, uh, praying for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And number 12, Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, y'all, Victoria's going to come up and welcome our speaker. Hi, I'm back. Um, okay, cool. So, um, our speaker tonight is, well, I just met her, but... Oh, the seventh tradition. I'm so sorry. I forgot. <laughs> Duh, the traditions. Um, so that's, we have a seventh tradition here. Um, it is that every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, I would like to pass the baskets. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses. The group provides many services. Your donations cover food, rent, bake books, CDs, events, and workshops. Um... There is no smoking on church property. Uh, please take a moment to silence all your cell phones and limit movement during the meeting and to avoid distractions. Um, so our speaker tonight is Alex. She's from New Jersey, um, and she's a very good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group. So let's all welcome her. Hi, guys. I'm Alex. I'm an alcoholic. Um, yeah, I live in Jersey now, which is weird to say I'm from, I'm from Philadelphia originally. Um, I have a hard time giving that up. But um, yeah, I, I'm grateful to be asked to come out here and speak. I haven't spoken in a meeting like this before, so it's a little intimidating. Me and my friend went to the, to the uh, bathroom before this to say a prayer, and I just asked God to help me not curse, um, which is very <laughs> difficult for me. Um, so yeah, so my sobriety date is December 10th, 2019. Um, I have a sponsor that I meet with once a week still, and I, I get to sponsor other women. And 
I'm very lucky I've been able to sponsor since I had about 70 days sober, um, and I'll get into that. But yeah, so like I said, I grew up in Philadelphia. My mom was a single mom, basically. Um, my dad overdosed from uh, drugs, obviously, um, when he was 26. I'm 32 years old, and uh, that's just wild for me to think about. Um, so I was five years old at the time, and then my mom remarried when I was about 11. They were married for, I think, I think at the most two months, and my stepdad committed suicide. And uh, you know, so there's some there's some outside issues that like I am responsible to take care of today as well. Um, but I remember from a very early age, and from my recollection, it was before my dad passed away. It was definitely before my stepdad passed away that I felt my skin just didn't fit. Um, and when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time when I was 19, when I got introduced to it in treatment. The only thing that made sense to me was people saying that, you know, they, they felt like they've been walking around their whole life, everybody else got handed a road map and they didn't, you know, and like that made sense to me. And when somebody sat down with the big book across the table from me for the first time and explained like the self-centered fear that we suffer from, that made sense to me. And I thought that selfishness had to be that, I don't know, I guess I thought it had to look more boisterous and grandiose and obnoxious, um, but my selfishness was like when I walk into a room, I think you're all thinking about me, and that's just not the case, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's not really anything else crazy that happened in my childhood except for a lot of death, um, but I had my first drink when I was 16, and I just remember everything about it, and if anybody else has had this experience, it, like, it was my first spiritual experience. And I was with a bunch of 19-year-olds in Westchester. Um, and I remember we had a handle of lad. And I just drank it straight because I tried to be cool. And I, as soon as it started to take effect, I don't know if it was, you know, two swigs in, three swigs in, four swigs in. But when it took effect, that was, like, the answer I'd been looking for my whole life. And I always say, like, I didn't know I wasn't breathing until I took a drink. And that's truly how I felt. I didn't feel... Like, I, you know, I hear people say, like, oh, I, got, I could talk to, you know, guys, or, but, like, I didn't care about anybody else. I just felt okay for the first time. That's all it was, you know? Like, I felt okay. Um, and I, like I said, I had no idea I wasn't before that. So, I got to a place, um, and excuse me if I'm a little <clears throat> nervous, but God will come in at some point. That's what usually happens. Um, but I, I got to a place by the time I was 19 that I ended up in treatment not knowing what alcoholism was or addiction or anything like that. Uh, but having you know friends in my life who appeared to drink like me, staging interventions with my family, a bunch of traitors, I didn't know what was happening. Um, and I remember thinking like, but you drink too. And everybody was like, not like you, dude. Like, you're out of control. Um, uh, and by the time I was 19, I was drinking you know, if I, if I went to a liquor store and I couldn't get anybody to buy me alcohol, that was usually what I would do. I would steal from family first. I would steal from whoever's house I was in. Then I would go to the liquor store and try to get people to buy me alcohol. Um, and if that didn't work, I was going to the grocery store and I was drinking cookie, sherry, and Listerine. Like, I'm doing whatever I can to get the next one. And, you know, I remember going to treatment at 19 and, uh, you know, you can't have, like, alcoholic... Uh, hand sanitizer with alcohol, and that made sense to me. I'll drink it. Like, I, that's just the kind of alcoholic I am. If I need to get the fix, I need to get the fix, you know? And, and like, that just made sense to me to meet people that were like, I would go to any length to get that experience again. So, something happened the first time I went in, and like I said, I, I heard that message of, of AA. The, the only thing I remember is this guy saying that he was walking around his whole life feeling like everybody got handed a road map and he didn't. But at the time, you know, I'm 19 years old. I think this guy's like 50. Now looking back, he's probably like 30 something. Um, and at the time, I'm like, I can't relate to anything this guy is going to say. Why am I going to pay attention? There's a cute dude to, you know, two seats over. I always picked up boyfriends in rehab. I don't know how you don't do that. Um, but you know, so this guy came in and he said that, and I, I just remember, it was the first time, there was a couple experiences like that, it was the first time that anybody put words to inside. Um, any group of friends that I ever had, anybody that I really interacted with, I was always trying to figure out what you needed from me, right? Like what I had to look like, what I had to sound like, I was just always trying to figure it out. 
And when I was around a bunch of alcoholics and addicts for the first time, I was like, oh my god, my people. Which is why it's so ridiculous that I get nervous to speak, because these are my people. You know what I mean? Like, if you get it, you get it. Like, I, like the rooms of AA are unlike any place I've ever been. And so, as I said, I pick up boyfriends in treatment. And uh, so I followed this guy that I was in treatment with to Levittown, Pennsylvania. Uh, lots of recovery houses. And... I don't know, God knew how to get my attention back then. That's what did it. And I get, I get around this group of women who are really young like me, right? I'm nine, I'm, I guess I'm about 20 at the time. I had a couple stints of going back to treatment before I went to Levittown. And uh, I'm around these young women who are like really lit up by the big book of AA, you know? And I've been in and out, obviously my, my sober date is 2019. I've been in and out for a long time. and. I used to, I used to not want to be like called a big book thumper. You know what I mean? And like I don't, I don't care today. <laughs> um, like I love that book, and it's the only book that's ever made sense to me. And so we would do things like we would like read the big book in the house, and uh, we went to a ton of different meetings, and you know we went to conventions and we went to roundups, and like getting sober this time during COVID was so weird because the AA that I knew and grew up on was different. You know, like. Uh, we just, we would get in the car and take road trips and it was just fun. Like, they just made it fun. I never thought AA was a death sentence. I never thought AA was like full of glum people. Just wasn't my experience. I liked, uh, you know, the chaos of a clubhouse. Um, I liked, you know, everything about AA. Everything about it. Um, the first sponsor that I had was, she was grace, honor, and dignity. She was. And when people talk about the light that you see in somebody else's eye, like that was her. And while she guided me through the book and gave me direction and told me to do things, like I, she led by example. And, you know, this woman was sober for seven years and then she picked up and she hasn't been back to the room since. And that was a long time ago and she's still suffering. And I think about her a lot and every time I think about her, I text her. And I don't know if I would love AA as much as I do without her. Um, but... You know, she walked me through this process for the first time, and as I go through my story, like, my experiences with AA have changed, and my experiences with sobriety have changed, I suppose, naturally. But, you know, the first time I went through those steps, I understood. Step one made a lot of sense to me. Like, I get it, you know. Um, I can't, when I put something in me, it's, it's almost easier for me to not put something in me than to put something in me and stop. It's impossible for me to stop. It's impossible. There's been a couple of times in my life where I've like white knuckled it for maybe a few days. I remember one time I went on a cleanse. I didn't drink for 10 days. I was gripping the bar when I went out with my coworker still. Like there's times like that where I can get the delusion that maybe I could control it. But for the most part, that's not the case. And um, the first big... The first big experience I remember having in that house and in that sobriety, I went to 12 years of Catholic school, right? And AA has also taught me not to place judgment on any type of, you know, religion or anybody's belief. Um, it's a big, broad, roomy place, thank God. And, but, you know, I had been, t my, what I grew up in didn't make sense to me, personally. And I remember sitting in that house and everybody had gone to bed, and I'm pretty sure it was the first night. And I don't know what came over me, and I don't know why, but I just started talking to God as if he was a friend. And I felt something. And I don't always feel something when I pray, but I felt something. And, you know, so I, I started to do work with this first sponsor, and I remember when I did my, my first four-step, I, I don't have the experience of being scared to do a four-step or it being like this big, bad, scary thing. That just wasn't my experience. It was like, if you want to experience freedom, you go through the 12 steps. They just kept it simple for me. And, you know, so I write the fourth step, and I'm as thorough as I possibly can be. And I do a fifth step with my sponsor. And I remember sitting on our, my little teeny tiny, I've been this height for a long time, <laughs> teeny tiny recovery house bed. And when, I, when we started doing my fifth step, I was looking at the bed, you know, like I was looking at my sheets, and by the time we got done, I could look her in the eye. And it was just a lot, it was the first time somebody, I said the most shameful things that I had done, and, and the things that I, 
hated about myself and, and the ways that I hurt people. And somebody just said, me too. Um, that was my first fist step experience, which, which I think was really vital for me. It was somebody saying, like, I did that too. You know, I'm like a baby, not understanding anything about life. And somebody says, like, I did those things too, and it's okay. Um, and it was huge. It was, a, it was a really big deal. So my first fist step experience, I did feel really good after. I did have those promises come true where I could look the world in the eye. Um, that wasn't always the case with a fist step over the years. Um, basically what happened the first time I got sober is I... You know, I ended up putting together a couple of years, and it was like really insidious because I remember before I picked up, I would like I would go to meetings and still be told like, "Man, you're doing so good," because I can sound fine and I can memorize things well, and I know the book, so it's really, really insidious and very. Uh, I can really fool people easily, myself, you know. And um, so I, I basically, I had gone through the steps. I had a couple of sponsees at the time, I want to say, maybe like one or two. I hadn't really done a, a whole lot of work with them. Maybe we got to, to step three. And, you know, I've picked up going to seven meetings a week, right? Like for me, I really understand having to live in the middle of the triangle, having to be in all three sides, because it can't just be one, you know. Um, and what goes for me first is prayer and meditation. It's the first thing that goes for me. I'm really good with action steps. I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. I'll go make an amends. I'll drive to the ends of the earth. I will sit down with a girl for hours. I will do inventory. Like, that stuff is easier for me to do, right? But the first thing to go is to sit down and get quiet, which is from my understanding and now my experience is very important. And so I did, right? I stopped writing inventory at night. I stopped going to God. I stopped trying to enlarge my spiritual life. Eventually I stopped going to meetings. You know, like that stuff follows, but that wasn't the first thing to go for me. And one night, you know that part in the book where it talks about suddenly? Every time I've picked up a drink, it's suddenly. Every single time. I have never seen it coming. And I got the idea that I was too young, you know, I was 22 at the time, 23, 22, 23, you know, and I was sick enough and, and far enough from God that it took one person to say to me, like, are you sure you weren't too young? And I said, yeah, you know what, you're right, I was too young. Um, and I remember that night, you know, I lived with sober people, and I remember... I picked up my phone. This is how delusional I am, right? Like, I picked up my phone because you have to understand, I had made true friends in AA, right? Like, I had made these connections I never had in my life. So out of respect for these people in my life, I picked up my phone. I said, hey, guys, I'm going to go and drink. Um, I've made up my mind. Don't worry. I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to live by principles. I'm just going to drink. And I really thought that that was possible. And um, so... Thank God, and this is really important to me, thank God, my sponsor, my network, nobody said, nobody tried to stop me. Like, my, the response that I got was, we love you, if you come back, like, we're here, you know, but we love you. And that, that was it. And you can't tell me anything. You can't tell me anything when my mind's made up. So it would have been pointless anyway. And I said, okay, great, love you so much, thanks, bye. And I drank. And... It was surreal. And like, when I say I was in AA, right, like I was, I was involved, like I was in AA, you know. And later down the line, right when I was getting sober this past time, like I would tell people AA doesn't work. That's where I was, because I thought, just because I did 85% of the program, that it didn't work. And I'm that hopeless variety alcoholic that has to do 100%, you know? And it doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean I, don't, I do it perfectly at all. You know, when I, I, I'm so transparent with my sponsees. Like, I tell them when I make mistakes, like we talk about, I don't know. For me, it's important for you guys to still be human, no matter how much time you have. It's, you know what I mean? So, um, anyway, I'm out for three years. And I remember when I was sober that first time, I went to this meeting at the 12 Keys, and there was this guy sharing a story. The things that stick with me are like so, you know, so random, but this guy was sharing a story and he said that uh, he had, f I, it's one way or the other, it was either that he had five years or 15 years, um, but my memory was that he said he had five years, drank, 
and he didn't get back for 15. And I remember being like, oh my God, like that's terrifying, terrifying. And I stayed out for three and um, I got to the place where I was um, experimenting and drinking copious, copious amounts of alcohol at work all the time. Uh, and I started ending up in psych wards and Horsham, Horsham Clinic. Um, and it felt like I was going crazy, you know? Like it felt like I was literally insane. But I would have to be, you know, I would have to be 302'd. I started getting really violent and nasty when I was drinking. It changed. I used to have fun. I wasn't having fun anymore. Um, and for whatever reason, at the end of those three years, I, again, agreed to go to treatment. And I didn't want to be sober. I have no idea why. I can look back and see where God touched, you know, my story at these different parts. But at the time... I think that my thought process was, I felt better after I went to this place last time. Maybe I'll just go again and I'll feel a little bit better and then I'll be okay. Um, and for the next roughly three years, I would do this stint of like, I'd get six months sober. So what I would do is I would come back to Bucks County, to the same people, to the same meetings, and be welcomed back with open arms. And Which is great. That is AA, right? You're, we're always welcome back. But I didn't do any work to change, I didn't do any work to grow, and I didn't, I wasn't uncomfortable, I didn't have to get uncomfortable. And every time I would get a sponsor, and every time we would meet once a week, uh, and most of the times there was a guy involved that inevitably became God at some point, and I just kept relapsing and I couldn't stay sober. And, you know, this is somebody, my friend told her story the other day, and I forgot about this, but when we were in treatment together, I was running big book studies in treatment. Like, that's sick. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm sitting here thinking, like, I know something, and that, like, I, I guess I just thought that was going to keep me sober, right? So, fast forward uh, to, to I get dropped in New Jersey. I'm losing my insurance. I get my first charge. I called the cops on myself. It's, we have time, but it's a long story. Um... And I get dropped in New Jersey. I know people that work over there. And I got a scholarship, right? Like, I got really lucky. And there's just so many times that God's picked me up and just plopped me down. Like, you're supposed to be over here. Stop going off the path. And, you know, so I, I go to this treatment center. And I'm just, it's, I, it was just a different experience. I'm used to walking into communities of 100 people, being able to distract myself right away. Um, and that wasn't the case this time. I'm stuck with like nine people just losing my mind. And I had gotten to a place where I was, uh, I was, I attempted to take my life. It didn't work, obviously. Um, I, I had gotten to such a like dark, dark, angry place. And the worst part of it all was that alcohol was not working anymore. There was no concoction or amount that I could put in my body. And as much as I love you fine people, you really are my people, if, if it still worked, I don't think I would be here. Um, I had to get to that place where it was like that, that jumping off point, you know? Like I couldn't live with, with and I couldn't live without it. It just wouldn't work. And those days of being able to take a couple drinks and take a big breath and everything was okay were just gone gone and it was the first time my family really was like you know they called me you know certain names and um I'm just trying to keep it in the bottle but I got to places I never thought I would get to and yeah it was the first time that people were like I can't do this anymore and at the same time I had built a life around sober people and these were sober people who loved me that were really, really close to me being like, dude, I can't do this. Like this, you gotta get help. You get help, great, but like I can't keep doing this. Um, so I, I go into treatment and I just, I just wanted to die. And most importantly, I didn't think I would ever be able to stay sober, ever. And I had this therapist there and I think it was a combination of, you know, getting these letters from home and a bunch of things happened at once so that right before I walked into her office, I was just sobbing and I had been cracked open. And I sat down and I just remember saying to her, it's like I had to convince people. I was like, you don't understand. I'm not going to get sober. Like, I can't stay sober. I've been trying for years. I can't stay sober. 
Um, and I, I don't know exactly what she said to me, but I got a little bit of hope that day for the first time. And what I found was like, every time I would get to this place where I was just completely cracked open, I could start to laugh a little bit. And it was like the more that I did that and got honest, the more that I could laugh and experience joy. And it was, it was really cool. And um, as I said, I would get boyfriends in treatment and I would follow men and um, I don't know, God just started doing things. I remember in my mind I was going back to the same recovery house in Levittown, back to the boyfriend that was waiting for me. And I swear to God, one day I was in treatment and I said, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go back. Like I remember my therapist saying, like, why don't you just try to stay here? And geographical changes are not the cure. Like, don't get me wrong. But I, I, like I said, I had not had to get uncomfortable for a long time. And for whatever reason, something clicked. And I said, like, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to stay. Like dramatically called my boyfriend, like, I'm not coming back. It's like 40 minutes away. <laughs> Literally, it was like, I'm not coming back. I'm staying in New Jersey. Um, and, I, and I stayed. And there were so many things that happened that, like, I would have not chosen before is the point, I guess. And so I'm in this recovery house, another sober house, and um, this woman that I had known from Philly, I'd got, you know, I'd obviously been to meetings in Philly and stuff, and this one woman was, she was just like around for some reason in Jersey. And she says that I asked her to sponsor me, I don't recall it that way. Um, I think she told me she was going to be my sponsor. And, you know, we started doing work together, and like this woman, I love this woman to death. Um, she says the most absurd, out-of-pocket things, and at the next sentence, there's God. It's, I would, if I wasn't trying to be respectful, I would tell you a story that she is something else. Um, and, and so what we started to do is we started to sit down and work together, and like I am a defiant alcoholic through and through. And let me tell you, I was so defensive when I got sober. I had no idea. I'm sure my friends can tell you that that are here. But I had no idea that I was so closed off and so defensive and, you know, whatever. And what we would do is we would sit down and we would start doing work together, and we'd have the book open, and she would give me direction. And I, I don't know how many times into us meeting this was, but... She gave me a direction and I said something like, well, that's not how I did it before. And she said, okay. Um, how about you learn to have a new experience? Because the thing is, is you might know how to quote this book, but you don't know crap about staying sober. She did not say it to me as calmly as that. She handed me my behind. Um, and I just remember, I, I was so resentful at my sponsor in the beginning. I was so, res I caught resentments at her all the time. But I, I stuck with her, like, because I knew she had a solution. I knew she had a relationship with God. I knew that she was like me, where she kept relapsing and kept relapsing. And, you know, when I first came around to AA, I thought, oh, this is for me. This is for me. I'm going to stay sober for the rest of my life. Um, and now, where God has made me the most useful is for people who think they're doing AA and relapse, and turns out they're not doing AA. Um, and so, I, you know, this woman just continues to grind my gears constantly. Um, but what I had learned through working with her was truly I was trying to stay sober off of the experiences that I had from like 19 to 23. That's what I was trying to stay sober off of. I never once tried to have a new experience. It was like, okay, we're back to the doctor's opinion. We're just going to do the same thing all over again. And not once did I have a new experience. And when we went through the steps, you know, she, we did things a little bit differently, like the same, right? We go through the book, but there were things that were different in... My step one, right, I, I would hear people at meetings say, and this might be their experience, that drinking is no longer an option, right? And for me, my step one, my understanding is drinking is always an option. If I understand the hopeless condition that I suffer from, I'm going to go through the rest of the work. Um, it is always an option. I have picked up crying. I, like, I have not wanted to drink, and I drank and have been baffled and just blamed you guys. It was like, this place, you know what I mean? Um, and so like the step one experience, like I, I was there. I, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I love when I hear people say like, AA is the last house on the block. This free thing, this is the last house on the block, man. You can try everything else, but don't worry, we'll still be here for you, you know? 
Um, and that was just my experience. And, and I get really lit up. My home group is a, oh, I didn't even say that, I'm sorry. My home group is a women's big book study in Audubon, New Jersey. Um, it's, it's, it's decently sized for a women's meeting. And it's funny because like you'll see people come in and they either get like so vulnerable and connect or it can be really intimidating. And then a lot of the times I see people come back a year later and I was like, yeah, I just couldn't do this at first. Like there's a lot of women and this is really intimidating. Um, it is the best, I think it's the best home group in the whole world. And at my home group, when we get, we just go through 164. That's all we do. And when we get back into, you know, the first few chapters, especially like more about alcoholism, I'm fired up. Like I'm ready to go. Um, because that is my experience. That is my experience. And so we do a second step and um, my only experience with the second step had been just write down what you want God to be, which is cool, you know? And we, we essentially did that, but she like tricked me. So she had a, a sheet of all these spiritual terms that they use in we agnostics. And then next to them, she was like, don't think, just tell me what comes to your mind when you hear this word. And at the end, she didn't tell me what she was doing. She just asked me to like tell her what these words meant to me. And then later that night, she sent me this little like thing she made on Canva or whatever, and it said Alex is God, and it was all these characteristics, and I do it with my sponsees that way, because it's like, just like this, it's just deep down in here, and if you don't think, and you don't get in your own way, the stuff that comes out is really cool. Um, and, and my God's changed since then a little bit, but for the most part, not really. Um, you know, and then when I take a third step, I've never, I don't think I've ever loved getting down on my knees and holding hands with another woman and saying the third step prayer. Um, but, you know, we did that, and, uh, you know, the way the third step was explained to me was just, just make a commitment to go through the rest of the steps. If I understand what I suffer from, if I understand that I need to be open to believing in something greater than me, and that I have to turn my will and my life over to that, I st the third step, I can get super philosophical and heady with it, but really it's like, do you understand that you have to go through this process to have a spiritual experience sufficient enough to, like, not obsess over alcohol anymore? And that made sense to me. So... You know, I do a fourth and a fifth with this woman, and my fifth step took 10 hours, and I wrote down, I'm not, obviously there's fear, right? We all know, like, what drives us, this self-centered fear, but I'm a resentful person. Like, I was, there was pages of a notebook just filled with resentments. People, you know, ha people that were happy in relationships, Levittown, Pennsylvania, AA sponsorship, everything that I was resentful at was on that piece of paper. And there were some really interesting things that came out of that. And like I said, my, my first fist step experience was one of, of feeling like I finally belonged, you know? And I remember people talking in the rooms about the steps and feeling a little bit separated because I hadn't been through them yet. And then you do a fist step and you're like, you feel like you, you belong more, you know? And that was my experience. This time, I got to see what I was without God. And it was really ugly to look at after all of these relapses, after all of these different experiences, it was really not fun. Um, and, you know, I took my hour faithfully. I think I did that the first time I got sober. I don't think I ever took an honest hour at the, in those sobrieties in between. It was just really important for me to take every direction as it was given to me. Like, not to skimp on anything. And, you know... Six and seven just comes up so much now, so much. Uh, my friend Eric said the other day in a meeting that the more he grows spiritually, the more sophisticated his defects become. And I was just like, oh, that sums it up, you know? Like, I don't really cheat anymore. I don't really outwardly lie anymore, right? But, like, I can get really, really self-righteous, you know what I mean? Um, like, the stuff that comes out more so now is more insidious. And, you know, so then I, then I get to my eight and nine, and every other sobriety, I had done the, the like, the five, you know? Your sponsor's like, make five, we'll keep moving. And the intention is you're supposed to keep going through your amends. And I didn't do that. When I did my ace at this time, I think I had about 40 cards. And I just, I did a lot of them in that first year. Um, bless you. But I just finished... My la I just did my last card like a couple months ago um, and never before had I done all of my amends and like what an experience what an experience like people talk about sponsorship sponsorship's great but if I'm really honest with you there's days where I just I want to 
kill my spawn seeds. I love them, but there's days where it's like, it's the days I'm trying to manage them, obviously. But um, when I went through my immense process, the freedom that I felt from immense, I would drive back to Levittown, Pennsylvania. I owed amends to so many people in AA. I owed amends to meetings. Um, I would show up to meetings plastered. You know, like say it's a meeting, it, w it wouldn't have been a meeting like this, but say, you know, it's a meeting like this, and I would walk in and just start screaming, like I was out of my mind. I was out of my mind. Um, but I thought you guys were the problem. Like I really did. And so I had to make amends to a couple meetings, and I was like, how do you make amends to meetings? And my sponsor was like, you show up early, you ask how you can help set up, you ask how you can be of service when you're there, and like you, if you're asked to speak, which is what happened, I was asked to speak at these meetings, you tell them exactly what you did the last time you were there, and how, like, you conduct yourself now, you know? Like, how did you get better? How did you find God? You just talk about what happened, you know? Um, and I'll tell you what, if I would have seen somebody like me acting the way that I did in meetings when I was wasted, standing up here or sitting, you know, at a table, I'd be like, oh, I guess this thing kind of works because I was just a nightmare, a nightmare. Um, so I had to make amends to a couple meetings. I, oh God, um, I, you know, there was a couple people's houses, friends in AA that I had stayed at their houses and snuck things into their home and um, did things in their home and with kids around and, you know, things like that. And there was old employers. Um, I would, my, spo my sponsor emphasized to me when it came to amends, like spiritual momentum, emphasized. Like, and everybody has a different experience. My current sponsor, I, I changed sponsors about halfway through my sobriety at this point. Um, my current sponsor is of the belief that like God places these people in your life when, when it's time, right? And it's not that I don't believe that, but my experience was you need to keep spiritual momentum. And so I was reaching out to one to two, two you know, men's cards a week and driving with sweat pouring out of my palms, thinking I was going to throw up all over the place. And because I had heard things in AA, like you have to have faith. You know what I mean? Like you have to replace fear with faith. And uh, my experience is not that necessarily. My experience is having the willingness to do something that scares the living crap out of me with God. Um, and like, my sponsor would have me do these really corny things. My sponsees make fun of me so bad when I tell them to do things like this today. But my sponsor was like, okay, so make God real. You got to open the passenger door in your car, open the passenger door. You got to pretend like you close your fist, you're holding God's hand, do that. Like, what do you have to do to make God bigger and make God real? Um, and that stuff works for me. And so I would do that. Um, and, and I just kept that up and, you know, I like that part in the book where it talks about us being the tornado and we think that like a man is unthinking if sobriety, if they think that sobriety is enough, you know? Because I would go into a men's thinking, I knew how I hurt you, and that's not true. In my experience, I have no idea how I hurt you because I'm not you. I can tell you like I've done, I know that I lied to you, I know that I stole from you, I know it was wrong of me to do this, it was inconsiderate, but the amends that were really impactful to me were like, you know, sitting down with my aunt being like, this is going to be an easy one because I was allowed back at, you know, dinner at this point and all that stuff. And her saying to me, you know, I set an alarm on my phone every hour to try and call you and make sure you weren't dead. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like, how arrogant of me to think that I know how I hurt people. And I'm really, really big on that with my sponsees. Like, don't chip yourself from this experience. You have no idea what you've done to people until they tell you. Um, and, and that was my experience going through all of that. There's, oh, there's other ones. There's so many, like, uh, you know, places I stole from. And I feel like there's one that I'm really forgetting. Um, but it'll, if it'll come, it'll come. Uh, and then I got to 10, 11, and 12, right? I got to 10, 11, and 12 right in. I did this thing. My sponsor didn't even suggest this. I don't know how this came about, but I heard of this thing called an inventory train, and it hooks you up with women all around the world. The first inventory partner that I had was in, like, I, I don't know, somewhere not in the United States. I don't know. Um, and it was such a cool experience. Like, every day, like, you go through the, you know, the nightly questions, and I got to speak to so many, like, amazing women, and I always suggest my sponsees do it for at least a couple of months, and... It was great, and uh, you know, my 11-step experience was like I 
guess it was more so my second step too. It was like, just say yes to everything. Um, if somebody asks you to go to a Buddhist temple with them, say yes. If somebody asks you to go to a non-denominational church, say yes. You know, And I was at the point where like, I'm telling you, my butt was on fire, on fire. I was dying, dying. And when I talk about my first sponsor, she gets a lot of, she gets the crap end of the stick when I talk about her. But in reality, this woman knew me because she was me, and she knew I was going to die. Like, I would call her, and there was times that I would balk, and she would say to me, like, I guess you don't understand what you suffer from. You really must not understand what you suffer from. Um, and she always got me to, like, keep moving my feet. And that's what my entire sobriety is based off of, right? Like, moving my feet, no matter how I feel. My entire life was dictated on doing things based on how I felt. And I cannot live like that anymore. I didn't necessarily feel like driving an hour and 20 minutes to come out here today. But I'm very glad that I did, right? Like, you just don't say no, you know, um, in my experience. So, so I have these, like, really cool experiences when it comes to 11, right? And I'm trying to say yes to everything. And I remember, like I said, I started sponsoring at like 70 Days Sober. And I remember uh, going to my grand sponsor's house at the time. I, like I said, my, my friends and family in early sobriety weren't really talking to me. Uh, two of my best friends are here tonight. It took a long time to gain back their trust. Um, and, and so my grand sponsor invited me to an hour long. I didn't know this at the time. She just invited me to her apartment with a bunch of other people to meditate. That's all I knew. And my sponsor was like, what else you got going on on a Friday night, dude? Like, go. Um, so I did. And I remember, I, it still cracks me up to this day. Um, the person with the least amount of time, I must have had 60-something days. And I'm sitting in a circle with maybe six other people. I don't know them from Adam, except for my sponsor and her partner. And they put on an hour-long Native American meditation chant thing. Hour-long hour long, 60 something days sober. And I remember, I, I would venture, it was five to 10 minutes in that I started thinking about a Newport, it could have been longer. Um, but I was sitting there like I am squirming, crawling out of my skin. And I remember at the end of this, <laughs> these people, I still don't know if I think they were lying still. I still struggle with that. But these people, you know, sat up from this meditation and they were like, oh my God, I saw my, my grandmother that's passed away and I saw a, a field with a rainbow. And, and I literally was like, I have a question. Um, I thought about a Newport the whole time. Am I going to be okay? Like, am I going to stay sober? Um, and my grade sponsor, I remember she looked at me like so knowingly, you know, like, oh honey, you know. And her partner, <laughs> her partner was like, may I place my hands on your head? And I said, in my head, I said, I'm done with AA, all right? Like, I'm done. <laughs> and so he did. I said, sure, right? I'm telling you. And I, I say yes to whatever I'm told to say. I said yes. And he placed his hands on my head, and I started hysterically sobbing. And I ha there was no thoughts going on in my head. And any time that I've had a spiritual experience, I am not able to put words to it, which I like, which to me like reminds me that it's like bigger than me because I can't understand it, you know? And I would have these experiences in sobriety a lot. I remember being, I don't know, I might have been four months in because I'm telling you, I was used to getting to six months and then picking up, you know, like I really thought I couldn't stay sober. And I was probably about four months in and I was in the bathroom in the sober living house crying on the phone with my sponsor. I remember people saying to me too, like, you know, everything's the end of the world with you. And I was like, but isn't it? Like, that's how it felt in early sobriety. That's how it felt. Like, my early sobriety was painful. It was painful. There was no pink cloud. And I think if it wasn't that painful, I wouldn't have done the work that I did to lay the foundation that I have today. And so I called my sponsor and I just remember saying, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna stay sober. Like, I'm so afraid I'm gonna pick up again. And that fear can come up a lot today, to be honest with you. I've had so many experiences with relapse in the past 12 years, right? I've never had this amount of time sober, but I've never done the type of work that I've done this time. And, um, but it can creep up, and it can be debilitating, right? Like, I have, like, a healthy fear sometimes, and then other times I have a debilitating fear where I keep God out completely, and it's, it's no use to anybody, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, I forget exactly where I was going with that, but... With an 11-step experience, 
my, my first sponsor said to me, what's going to happen is, is you are going to stay sober. Your life is going to get very full. And if you do not maintain a relationship with God and enlarge your spiritual life, you cannot keep up with it. Um, and that is what has happened, <laughs> for sure. Um, and, and the way she explained it to me was so beautiful. It was like, because I, I would look at her sponsor a bunch of people. She, you know, uh, she was pregnant when we were doing my fist step, and you know, so she gives birth, and she's running around like a nut, you know, and she's doing all these things, and she's like happy and, and joyous and free. And I'm like, how? Like, how are you doing all these things, and how are you not like a homicidal maniac like I would be? And she was like, because I have a relationship with God, you know. And that part in the eleventh step when it says when I stopped trying to, to arrange life to suit me, I somehow magically have the energy to like go about the life that God has planned for me. Um, and that has also been my experience, you know, like, I really look up to those people in the rooms who just are able to wear the day like a loose garment. I, that is so attractive to me. How do you just let stuff roll off your back? I don't know what that's like at this point. Maybe that'll come. I don't know. Um, but I think it's amazing when people can just go like, oh, well, I did have this plan, and it fell through, and that's okay. God has another plan for the day. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I'm just going to keep asking God to help me with that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was also told, I, I like Sandy B a lot, if anybody's heard of Sandy B's speaker tapes. I like Sandy B a lot, and I like the way that he talks about God and, and, and like, perception. And, um, you know, I, the one speaker tape that I have listened to a couple of times, and he talks about, like, picking up spiritual books. Like, you need to, like, be reading, too. And, and the trap that I can fall into with Eleven, though, is that I think God is out here only, and God is in here, right? And I remember sharing at a meeting... One of my best friends overdosed and died two years into my sobriety, and that like rocked me, rocked me. Um, but it was also the first time that I got to grieve and also show up. That's never happened before. I just shut down, everything becomes about me, I isolate, and I can't show up for you. And it was the first time in my life, like I said, I've had a lot of death, and it was the first time in my life that I could, we went to his funeral and, th and then left to drive up to Massachusetts for an AA wedding that night. And like intermittently that weekend, I was hysterically sobbing and then celebrating other people. And that was okay. Like both of those could happen. Um, so that was my experience with step 11 is very much like I have to continue to seek. And, and doing all of the stuff outside, right? Like reading all of the different books. Like, um, and I know that New Pair of Glasses is literally a speaker tape turned into a book, but it is my favorite book in the entire world. I love that book. Um, and over the years, people have given me some awesome recommendations, and I've read some beautiful things. I just finished like A Purpose Driven Life, and I try to always be reading something spiritual as well. Um, but the real God consciousness, the real 11-step work from my understanding is within and after my friend had died, I would go to meetings and say, like, uh, I just stopped, like, like, I'm praying, but I'm praying in a perfunctory way. Like, I'm not talking to God the way that I talk to God for the first two years of my sobriety. And, um, and I said, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to different services again. I'm trying to do all these different things. And this older gentleman shared, and he said, you know, uh, like, it's built, it's built in, you know what I mean, at the factory. It's built in. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's right. It's, I'm supposed to go within. Um, and I come up against that a lot. And I was just talking to somebody the other day. And they s put it to me. And I hope this is helpful to somebody. It really helped me. Like, just why don't you just show up every day for 10 minutes in silence, right? Because it was also explained to me that I'm going to hear God more likely when I'm silent and not listening to, like, something. So why don't you show up in silence and just sit down and pretend like, you're sitting at God's feet and you're like, if today's the day you want to give me, you want to tell me something, great. If not, that's okay too. I'm just going to keep showing up every day. Um, and I know at some point you're going to tell me something. And I was like, oh my God, so simple. Why do I complicate these things? Um, you know, and when it comes to step 12, like I said, I was sponsoring when I had about 70 days. And, and so my conception of sponsorship was very much askew because I thought it had anything to do with me. The only thing it has to do with me is that it keeps me sober. Um, and my, my sponsor at the time, if, if, if not, 
you know, some things I was always honest with her. I was always, always rigorously honest. And so I would go to meetings and they would say, is anybody available to sponsor? And she would tell me to start raising my hand and I wouldn't raise my hand and I would go and tell her that. And that was one of the times where she said to me, I guess you don't understand what you suffer from because you are so self-centered. Like you have to get in service to other people. You, you're gonna die, that you're gonna die from this disease. And so I went to a meeting, it was like a Chris Brennan meeting or something. And they were talking about how Ebby Thatcher had 60 days sober when he 12 step bill essentially. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. You know, like that's it. I'm, I'm putting this whole emphasis on something that it doesn't need to be. And I talked to my grand sponsor at the time, and she was like, dude, it's, it's your experience and it's a book. And I only say that because I know a lot of people who get scared with like sponsorship, and it's not anything but your experience. If I'm trying to impress you as a sponsor, I'm doing something wrong. I just have to sit here and be honest with you. And the, the minute that I raised my hand, I, I haven't not had sponsees since, and I've been so lucky and so blessed. And, um, you know, it's been a, there's plenty of, of stories and situations when it comes to sponsorship. Uh, like I said, I, I appreciate when people say like, oh my God, I want to kill them, you know, um, because that has absolutely been my experience. And then there's been times where I'm crying because I'm so grateful for them. And, you know, I got to watch one sponsee get married and, um, like, it's just cool the things that I get to, to see. And it really is true, that whole idea of, like, they help me more than I help them. And there's been plenty of times when I'm in my own stuff and I'm, woe is me. And, but because of the foundation that was laid for me, I know that just because I don't feel good doesn't mean I get to cancel step work in an hour, right? Like, that's not a thing in my, in my sobriety. And what happens every time is I'm jammed up, I'm in a spot, a sponsee comes over, and what do you know? everything's okay and whatever I'm going through is really not that big you know um, I don't know I uh, like I said I, I appreciate you guys asking me to come speak I'm very subdued compared to what I normally am because I'm trying to be very respectful um, I don't want to say anything inappropriate or, or anything like that but I, I but I hope something that I said was helpful the the main thing that I always try to get across is that it doesn't matter how bad I want to be sober um, all that matters is the action that I put in. And to stay honest, I never want to get up at any podium or raise my hand in any AA room and, and you know, bull crap you guys. I hate curbing this. <laughs> I, I never want to do that, you know? Because of all the people in the world, I should be able to get up here and say like, I should be able to tell you guys, man, I've been so intolerant lately, right? Like, man, like this defect has been coming up. This is what's going on. You know what kept me really sick is when I had a year sober and I thought I had to stop having defects and be perfect. That kept me really, really sick, dude. Really sick in other sobrieties. Um, and it's really important that I tell you like who I am and be really honest. And the first person I'm gonna lie to is me, obviously. Um, but that's really important, you know? And I appreciate when people say things like Ron was saying before, like just have fun. You know, I'm in this, like, situation right now. It's lit. I'm just dating. That's the situation. <laughs> it's literally nothing serious. <laughs> and, um, and I'm, like, talking to my sponsor, just, you know, so in my head. And she's like, what if you just, hear me out. What if you just had fun and, like, trusted God? I'm like, that is wild. <laughs> what a wild thing to recommend. Um, you know, but, but this idea, and Ron said that, too, before I got up here. You know, he was like, just have fun. And I make this so serious, right? Because I want to be—I want to be a good speaker, and you know, like all these things. And the, and the truth of the matter is, like, I'm a drunk, dude. I shouldn't be sober. I shouldn't be sober. Um, that whole idea of like, well, I deserve, right? And I'm not saying don't have standards for yourself, but if I got what I deserved, I would be dead. That has always been my experience. Like, I don't. Realistically, I don't deserve to be here. Um, and I'm really lucky that I get to be here. So um, I think that's all I got. And thank you for sharing. Sure. Okay, incredible stuff. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Brian. I'm an alcoholic. A uh, couple quick announcements, and we'll close down the meeting here. 
Uh, as was mentioned, the Food and the Fellowship for this group starts every week at 8 o'clock. So feel free to show up early, join us, enjoy the refreshments, the coffee we put out. If you do want to get involved in service with this group, help out with this group, we always because you use help setting up the meetings, that kind of thing. As Ron alluded to before the meeting, this group has uh, you know H&I commitments, that kind of thing. We have a running one in Quakertown that we go to every Sunday night. So if you'd be interested in doing that, coming out, you can see me, see Ron, see any home group member after the meeting. We can get you some information on that. Um, there's always the meeting after the meeting, so I say if you're out there, if you're new, or if you're struggling, hang out with us. There's always a group of us. We'd love to talk with you, get you some numbers, get you some meetings, get you tied in with this thing, get you into the solution. Uh, if you want to help out with some service right after the meeting, we could use help putting the chairs away. Uh, we're, we're a little displaced from our normal setup tonight. It bears worth mentioning. The reason we're displaced and we don't have access to the stage is because the church is doing code blue for this month. So if you show up here and we're not in this room, our normal room will be in the uh, small room that's right on the other side of this wall if you come in the main entrance over here it's right to the left the hallway right to the left but uh, yeah we'll put away the chairs we're gonna fill up that rack in the back corner there and then whatever doesn't fit we're gonna put in this closet over to the side here um, thanks to everybody for helping out with the meeting you know thanks to all our greeters our readers uh, thanks to our coffee maker um, Howard uh, it, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, Oh yeah, and it is customary for us to thank our speakers as they do come here on their own time and expense to share their experience, strength, and hope with us. So we usually do form a line in the front here and we thank our speakers. And let's give our speaker, Alex, one more line. And if you do care to join us, we have a beautiful way of closing. I guess we're going to circle up. We're going to circle up. we got a lot of people here. I think we might do it. We will, uh, we'll, uh, and we'll uh, close down the meeting as always with a brief moment of silence for the still sick and suffering alcoholic inside and outside of these rooms, followed by our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Keep coming back at yours if you are ready.